Hello, hello, hello. I am particularly delighted today to be joined by the brilliant Daniel Levy, who is the, he's got so many hats that I'm just going to just throw a few hats off his head. Um, he's, for example, former, uh, he was on the negotiating team um, when Ehud Barak was Prime Minister of Israel. Um, he has been involved in many think tanks, specialising, of course, in the Middle East. He's a commentator, he's an analyst, many, many hats, Daniel. How are you? Hello. Overwhelmed with hats, Owen. How are you? I'm, 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 I'm all good. You're juggling them very well. Um, so we're now 11 weeks into this horror. I, I always struggle to find the exact proper term to describe what this is. I think horror will do for now. I just want to start, actually, just because, you know, you were under Ehud Barak and also a junior member under Yitzhak Rabin, who was obviously prime minister of Israel back in the 1990s before his assassination. Um, and it's just recently we've had these comments by um, Zippy Hotavelli, who is the Israeli ambassador to the UK, in which she said uh, that there, would be, there was no chance of any future Palestinian state. And then Mark Regev, the former ambassador, um, who was a spokesperson, I suppose, for the Israeli government, uh, said uh, that actually they'd never, that under even under Yitzhak Rabin, who was the prime minister, who was associated with the Oslo Accords and being a peacemaker, the Palestinians were promised an entity less than a state. So I'm just interested in that because there's a narrative of the Palestinians always had these opportunities to have a state. They didn't accept them and they brought this on themselves, basically. What do you think about that whole narrative and what, what the comments of Mark Regev and of Zippy Hotavelli? Yeah, I think there's some really important stuff to unpack there. Um, let me relate to what Mark Regev said and Rabin's position. And, and we can't know, right? You can't do the counterfactual. He gets assassinated in November of 1995 by a, a, a religious Jewish extremist. Um, I, I actually think most Palestinians who look at the history of this would sign up to what Mark Regev said, unusually, and, and say, yeah, that's exactly the point. We have never, this idea that, that Palestinians have, have consistently missed opportunities, been rejectionist, well, we've never been offered a sovereign state. Thank you for clarifying that, Mr. Regev. Rabin was perhaps on a journey, and things that he said uh, would be red lines before he came into office in 92, once he was in office, uh, began to shift. I don't know how far he was capable of shifting. I don't know how far that national movement in its current incarnation is capable of shifting at all. So that's that's one piece of this. Sipi Chotoveli, uh, the ambassador of Israel here in the UK, simply reminded us that the guidelines of the current government, and in that respect, it's not really an outlier, are that, that all of the land of Israel belongs only to the Jews and all of it should be settled and a Palestinian state is totally off the table. Now, that reminder is important because it kind of speaks to the nonsense that is the stuff of Western policy of the American government, of the UK government. They constantly talk about two states and yet the more powerful party, the occupying party, the only party that can allow, because this two state stuff is also, I mean, if you believe in that outcome, there is one state already, it's called Israel. So this is really about deoccupation and establishing Palestinian sovereignty. And that requires Israel to go along with it. Israel categorically rejects that outcome. So what are you going to do about it rather than just mouthing these platitudes? Um, I, I would suggest there's a couple more levels of depth to this that are worth going into, Owen, if, if I can. Um, one of those is that the entire premise of a peace process which to the outside was designed to achieve a Palestinian state, but apparently that was never pushed sufficiently with Israel because there's never been an Israeli uh, official decision, a governmental vote, a, a, a vote in parliament to uh, adopt two states. That was premised on saying we can resolve the issues that arose out of the war in 1967. Okay, out of the occupation 
so there's a step one step back. There's a UN partition plan, right? The partition plan gives a slightly more to the establishment of a Jewish state. This is after British colonial withdrawal, uh, slightly less than about 55, 45, uh, a Jewish state versus a Palestinian Arab state, a, a special status for Jerusalem. So it was called a corpus separatum. Um, mm. That is backed by a UN, which at the time is pre-decolonization. So this is a UN which doesn't have the, the countries that are now in the UN that become independent that have gone through colonization. Um, it's accepted um, by Israel, but then Israel takes 78% of that land, expels the Palestinian population, Nakba. That's why most of the Palestinians in Gaza still today are living in refugee camps, not been able to return. The peace process is basically saying, we're gonna skip over that and we're going to address what happened in 67, where Israel took control of the other 22%, West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem. Now, I think where, where, what we've kind of come to is, given that Israel was unwilling actually to do a Palestinian state on 22% of the land, the attempt to brush under the carpet the, the issues from 48, those other historical issues, I think are back, are back to the fore. So you haven't managed simply to, to resolve what theoretically could have been the easy stuff. The, the last thing I'd say on this is if indeed, if indeed you reject a Palestinian state on 22% of the land, which Israeli officials have helpfully clarified to us that they do, what are you offering? Are you actually the, the, the Smotrich Ben Gavir camp? We have everything, we get rid of them. Are you acknowledging that what you have in mind is the apartheid system, which has been the legal designation, not only of Palestinians, Israeli NGOs, international NGOs. So what is it you're actually suggesting? Before I ask you just a bit more about that, because I think that's crucial, really, in terms of understanding what happens next. Um, I'm, I'm, I am interested in just the, the question about the relationship between Benjamin Netanyahu and Hamas, because there's been a lot, for example, in Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, about the essentially suggesting that it obviously served um, the purposes of the Kud, the ruling party, and others associated, with, I suppose, the, with, with that project, uh, to divide the Palestinians between the West Bank and Gaza um, to make sure then they couldn't have a so-called partner for peace, which they could claim as legitimate. And that essentially Hamas was propped up to a degree by Benjamin Netanyahu. What do you, what do you think about that? So as with many things, there's an element of truth to it and there's an element of convenience to a narrative <clears throat> that I think sometimes, especially in Israel, um, everything gets attributed to Netanyahu. And, and, and yeah. if, if, if this problematic chap at the top were removed, we could all move on. Because I say that because, yes, it's true. Of course. And why should we be surprised? that Israel has pursued a policy of divide and rule with the Palestinians. I mean, it's it's classic strategy. It's classic settler colonial strategy. What's what's to be surprised about here? Um, Netanyahu, and of course, has has been the one who has been in power most of the years when, Ga when Gaza has been under a Hamas authority, most of the years of this Palestinian division. The division happens in 06, 07, 06 is the election, 07, Hamas having won the election, gone into a, a shared government. There's an attempt to overthrow Hamas, Hamas pushes back on it. Um, I mean, in a, in, in a way, they, they're, they're, they're kind of accidental rulers of Gaza by, by dint of having pushed back against an attempted putsch. So Netanyahu has been in power since 2009, other than a brief hiatus when there was this hybrid government led by um, Naftali Bennett. So yes, Netanyahu has done that. But no, the Israeli system has not offered an alternative. So it's not like you've had a decade and a half where opposition parties have said, this is how we're going to offer a different way forward. And the other crucial thing to bear in mind is the Palestinian division and the debilitating impact that has on any potential Palestinian strategy to, to assert their rights, that division is first and foremost something for the Palestinians to deal with. So just because Israel pursued this, it doesn't mean that the Palestinian leadership was bereft of any way of going about challenging it. They chose, the Palestinian Authority 
in the West Bank. Unfortunately, and I think to their discredit, and it's why they're so unpopular today, amongst other things, they chose to go along with this Israeli US Western backed project of division. They could have gone and there were often talks and there were even agreements and they were never honored. And of course, Hamas also had its positions that it was pushing. But I think primarily here, it's been a Palestinian leadership failure, which its own, most of its own people acknowledge and are ill served by to reunite, to, to, to have a, a renewed national movement that can set forward the Palestinian position and the challenge to the circumstances under which they live. In, in terms of what's what's happening, what's going to happen next? And I mean, that, the point actually when Zippy Hotevelli was asked by a Sky News correspondent um, that point about will there be a Palestinian state? And she said, absolutely not. A lot of people frustrated that he wasn't then pushed to go, what does that mean then in practice? Uh, sorry, she wasn't pushed to, to ask what that means in practice, which you just alluded to. And I'm just wondering in terms of Gaza now, I mean, there were 2.2 million Palestinians there before this began. I, I do believe a significant chunk of, will die, not just because of violence, but you have a collapse of the healthcare system, disease, all the rest of it. That's generally in wars, people more die more because of that than, than the violence. Um, and there's obviously there's 3 million um, Palestinians or so in the West Bank. But do you think this is what Ben Wallace, the former Tory defence secretary, calls a killing rage? So it's basically just vengeance without a clear endpoint strategy. Or do you think there's actually a very significant chance in Gaza there that we will get the ethnic permanent ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian population, which frankly... Some Israeli politicians are not actually being particularly subtle about. Let's be let's be honest. You you, you have that way of British understatement, Owen. Um, <laughs> yes, sorry. So cheerful. I, I think we should have very good cause to take extremely seriously what you just said. To take extremely seriously what we are being warned of every day. I've been speaking to senior UN officials, whether it's whether it's the head of UN, UNRWA, the, the agency that deals with refugees, whether it's the Food and Agriculture Organization, whether it's the half a million are now at risk of starvation. Um, all of these things are, are, are surely reason enough, more than reason enough, for this to be brought to an end, rather than to have the US nickel and diming resolutions at the UN Security Council so that they have become devoid of all meaning and so that the, the killing carries on. Because as you say, the, the deaths that are a direct result of the um, pretty indiscriminate uh, Israeli military strikes are in danger now of being surpassed by deaths as a consequence of the uh, of the humanitarian conditions. We're going into winter, the sanitary conditions are appalling, the, the, the availability of food, clean water, medication, etc. And you then place that alongside what we've heard, not just from media talking heads in Israel, but from the most senior politicians that, that remember the first reaction by Israel to what was a horrific violation of international law in the attack on October 7th. The first reaction was, we will close all food, water, fuel, medical supplies. In other words, collective punishment was the act of first resort. And it was justified by these series of statements from across the board. President Herzog was no better or worse. The military leadership were no better or worse. There's no such thing as a civilian. You still have people going on TV saying we should have killed 100,000 in the first time. So I take seriously the idea when someone says, you know, mass disease and starvation, and this is a former senior general who's advising the leader of the opposition in Israel, uh, Giora Island, he, he is then praised by current sitting ministers. Starvation and disease are part of the solution. We should take this seriously. We should take seriously because we know this was part of the, the options being considered, mass displacement of Palestinians uh, into Egypt. Israel used to deny the Nakba, the mass ethnic displacement of Palestinians in the war around Israel's creation, 47 to 49, three quarters of a million Palestinians displaced. The, the, just the trajectory of how Israel relates to the Nakba is interesting in itself. From denying to Israeli historians having backed up the, 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 the facts that Palestinians have brought out, 
to prove that there, this Nakba had happened. Now to threatening a second Nakba, which is what mm. it's proliferated as a, as a kind of speech. So it's, it's important also to acknowledge that this, this, this intentionality, this strain of thinking applies not just to Gaza. It applies to Palestinians across the expanse that Israel controls and certainly in the West Bank as well. Um, so we should take that very seriously. Now, what it also speaks to is you have in your government in Israel ministers who, who it's not a case, Owen, where we have to kind of filter through every interview and say, ah, got you. You see, you, what you just said kind of amounts to apartheid. No, these are people who openly profess their allegiance to eradicationism, ethnic cleansing, the not only the, the uh, uh, a state in which there is gradations of rights, a, a kind of Jewish supremacy, as it has been called by many in Israel as well, but a, actually space for one people only. And therefore the question becomes, if the Ben Gavirs and the Smotriches do not represent the trajectory of where Israel and Zionism are going, then what is the alternative? Because if the alternative is neither equality within the one space that has been created, nor full deoccupation, and for Palestinians to have a genuinely sovereign state, then you're in variations of, 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 of apartheid. So I think it's, it's crucial that going forward, we actually hear an Israeli alternative to Ben Gavir and Smotrich that isn't, no, we're not extreme, we're not going to expel them, we're just going to have them live here under apartheid. Now, if I can, I would also say that, that it really matters, therefore, that on the Palest from Palestinians, we hear not just a rejection of those things, but if the analysis has settled to a position where we are facing what is a settler colonial movement, and if the acknowledgement is that the Jewish Israeli population is not going anywhere, this is a rooted population, therefore, what is the future of, of equality for Jewish Israelis? Is it that there it is the position, a Palestinian state, but also to fight for the equality for Palestinians inside Israel, the almost two million Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, and of course, to continue to to work to achieve the rights of refugees. Is it a, a one political space of equality? Maybe that's collective national rights for both peoples. But I also I think the onus is a little bit also in, in presenting that freedom charter, which also has something to say to the Jewish Israeli future on the land. I mean, looking for hope amongst what we're looking at at the moment seems a challenge, I would say. Let's just be honest. It's a challenge. And I suppose on that, you know, I mean, the old Israeli left has just just disappeared. Uh, there was a much, much bigger peace movement in Israel than, than there was now. Um, the polling of the Israeli population shows, a, you know, I mean, because I keep interviewing Israeli peace activists and they're so incredibly courageous, like standing together, you know, bringing together Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel together to fight for the sort of future you're talking about. And they're extremely courageous people, and they're so marginalised at the moment. Um, there is a consensus in Israeli politics, which is so much further to the right than it was, obviously, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, I mean, look, I don't want to get into the question, I'm not talking about genocide, just making this point. When I interviewed Raz Sigal, the Israeli um, American, uh, sorry, Israeli American historian, I mean, he, when he was saying that intent is so rarely said, what some of the things you were talking about, what what's said, it, it, the fact is, you're, you're hearing what it is genocidal language. It, it, what's actually happening is a separate issue. It's genocidal, murderous language. But it's across the board. It's the opposition. It's the government. It's the media. These are popular sentiments. How how is that possible to change? Because I suppose in South Africa, there's there's, there's obviously similarities and differences. Um, but what happened was a lot of the white population came to the conclusion that that, that was no future for apartheid because the international community so-called um due to the anti-apartheid movement had shifted uh, and they were so isolated that they had no choice but that's not going to happen in israel so it kind of makes you think well what's the incentive 
for that to change. And that consensus is just going to fur further move to the right and there'll be more, ever more legitimization of the most extreme possible solutions, which are just openly being talked about, I suppose. Cheerful. Right. Yeah. Um, first of all, let me endorse what you said about um, those those people who, you know, from being an important camp in the Israeli political ferment, uh, have become something of a dissident minority, and 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 the courage of that. I, I also want to speak to the to the courage of of Palestinians just going about the daily life of of resilience, of of of, of living under those conditions, and of challenging those conditions. Let me start with where you finished in terms of the premise that impunity will continue to guide the external response to what Israel is doing. Because I'm, I've become, uh, it's hardly like, wow, what, what an insight. I think it's obvious, but I think it's worth saying, I have become absolutely convinced that we would not have gotten to where we are uh, were it not for the fact that there were no cost and consequences. I actually remember and lived through a time in Israel where it wasn't the best argument, but at least it was an argument where the argument was made, look, whatever you think about the Palestinians, and, and, and there are those of us who will defend universalist principles of humanity, and there are those who won't. But let's agree on one thing. We won't get away with it. Israel will not be able to move forward, have a good economy, have good relations, because the world won't accept it. And, and that I think that was a crucial background to the initial Oslo breakthrough after the mm -hmm. first intifada. The history of this century is the extent to which that has been disproven in the lived reality of Israelis. The extent of the, glo the global Western-led, American-led normalization of the abnormal, indulgence of the violations carried out, and the cherry on the cake of that was the Abraham Accords, was when you had, led by uh, the UAE, um, Arab states, um, I think, against where their publics were at, um, taking that step. Okay, so I do think that it would need to be part of the mix that Israelis again feel <clears throat> that there is a cost, there is a consequence, a palpable one. I'm not saying Israel could be bludgeoned and sanctioned into deoccupation, but I think without that in the mix, it's really hard and that is difficult. And Israel, the discrediting, the criminalization in fact, in this country, in January, a bill will go through Parliament, which takes a, a significant further step to criminalise it, calling for the sanctioning of Israel for its violations of international law. Israel knew what it was doing because it knows this is a potential vulnerability. Has the mobilisation uh, in response to what, what has gone on uh, these past weeks shifted that equation too early to say? I uh, I just want to want us to keep our eyes on that. That has to always be be part of any approach. Now coming back to what goes on on the inside and the realities of Israeli politics today. Um, undoubtedly, everything that you said, everything that we've seen, the statements, the polling, the desire for revenge is 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 real, and it it accelerates a pre existing trend in terms of that journey away from uh, accepting Palestinians as equals uh, Palestinian rights. However, it also feels like we're getting to crunch time. That, that, that equation I drew earlier, which is the logical end point of where you go there is Ben Gvir Smotrich. Hmm. So if you do not think that this is the way forward for Israel, to be an extremist fundamentalist state 
that is constantly at war that has to displace Palestinians. Does that work for you? Is the complicity, the culpability of the front line surrounding hinterland Arab region going to continue? Can you rely on that? You see, I don't think that's a recipe uh, for Israel's well-being either. And I do think that you will get pushback. You will. I mean, by the way, we've seen some quite, one has to acknowledge, effective asymmetr asymmetrical warfare capacity being waged by, by Hamas, by the armed resistance. You see groups in the West Bank. You see the, the disquiet uh, in the surrounding region. Um, I don't think that works out for Israel. I think by, by dint of Israel's very integration into the world, its wealth, it has vulnerabilities. So the thing that I'm clinging on to is the following, that a combination of eventually being able to generate some of this outside pressure, one, a shift in Palestinian leadership in terms of its message, in terms of the capacity to articulate that message. The amazing Palestinian voices we hear, unfortunately, do not speak for the leadership. The ambassador here in the UK is an exception in that respect. A very effective voice who also is part of the structure. Mm. But if we can get that unified Palestinian, renewed political capacity, strategy, ability to articulate that, number two, if we see the geopolitics shifting, because the difference today is that America can still use its bloody veto at the United Nations Security Council, but this is not a unipolar world. The geopolitics is shifting. Bring in other actors. Three. And this moment of truth for Israeli society, that the alternative to the Ben Gavir Smotrich can't be a watered down version of apartheid. So who are you? So I've listed four things really hard to choreograph and bring those things together. But that's where I think that, that after something so disruptive, when you're staring into the abyss, things can actually uh, move in, in unexpected and quite accelerated ways. And I should pause there because I, uh, otherwise it will be like I've been drinking pre-Christmas and I'm being excessively optimistic. <laughs> No, I mean, just finally on that, because you've got to go to a, a, a vigil. Um, and also my cat is is trying to intrude on our conversation. Um, that's Rickman. Um, just, just finally, I mean, I suppose the bleak, which I don't think a lot of people are actually discussing properly at the moment, which is, it's interesting. We've got, at the moment, um, Joe Biden is facing a severe backlash at home, partly actually because younger voters are the most pro-Palestinian um, in, in, in American generation American history. Um but what that actually means is a lot of them may not actually come out and vote for Joe Biden uh, come the election and Donald Trump may become president. And that's not that far away. The American election is now 11 months away, less than 11 months, 10 and a half months away. And um, if Donald Trump becomes president of the United States, what the hell happens then? And I think just fine, because that's such a bleak thing to end on. If there's any hopeful thing you can think of at the end, just to just segue uh, to the end. Uh, so people aren't terminally depressed, that would be helpful. But yeah, the spectre of Trump, what the hell would that mean in practice? I I think that's a disaster for, for America, uh, for my American friends, um, internally. But for Palestine and in Israel? Uh, well, for every, well, here's where I'm going to... Think, I think the Biden administration have been criminal in their handling of this and in their handling of um of the of of the issue overall but in these last 11 weeks there has been a criminality to their position uh, i think it has ill-served american interests i think it has ill-served their own domestic politics as you say um so i don't know whether an administration that uh is probably weakening America and is, is caught up with so much internal stuff will even be worse. I don't wish it on Americans, but I actually, I actually think, look, 
would Trump have brought this to a quicker conclusion? I don't rule that out. I actually think 8,000 dead Palestinian children later, coming off the back of the neglect prior to this, which kind of paved the way also to what happened on October 7th, I think that's a hugely negative scorecard for Team Biden. And I would urge them to think hard about that and, and to try and find a course correction because it is pathetic that you are saying, um, conduct the war differently. We don't want to see this level of civilian casualty. Uh, okay, uh, by the way, are you still going to give us the weapons? Oh yeah, 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 we'll still give you the weapons. Are you still going to make sure nothing serious happens in the UN? Oh, of course we'll make sure of that. Are you still going to parrot our talking points? Oh yeah, yeah, we'll do all that. Okay, so what was it you asked us for? I can't remember. Oh, don't worry, because then it's not serious. Okay, um, and I th and I and I do think they've got a real problem at home, and I think he not only is he l losing potential voters, certainly voter enthusiasm, and the people he, who he, Biden will need to go out and campaign, and a whole nother cohort of Americans who are saying, "Why are you so obsessed with this issue? What about mm -hmm. taking care of the problems at home?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, to, to, to try and insert some kind of uh, hope in the end here, I, I will just say this to, to, to anyone who, who feels so inclined. The, the, the thing that the entire paradigm of partition and of, you know, we just have to separate these guys out. The thing that I think that it in in, encourages is dehumanization of the other side. And, and I'm not going to both sidesism. I'm perfectly aware, and it's in, integral to, to how I see this whole thing, that there is a power dynamic, there's an asymmetry, there's an occupying party here and an occupied people. But we have to keep eye contact with our own humanity. And with, with the fact that these are human beings on both sides who, who, have, who, who, you know, in different ways have gone through a horrific rupture. And I would just say to people, if, you know, if you don't think about Israelis much as anything other than people who do horrendous things, just take a few minutes and read a testimony of someone who was impacted by October 7th. Just reconnect with the fact that these are human beings. And if you're someone who is all in, Israel needs to win, take a few minutes, read a testimony of, of what a Palestinian is going through now, what Palestinians go through every day, every year, every generation under occupation and connect with the humanity of those people. And, and, and then come back, check your political positions. They may be the same, but you'll have more humanity as you put them forward. I think it's a beautiful place to end. Always keen to end on discussions of humanity, particularly in the current um, horror, as I keep saying. Um, that was a brilliant tour de force. Thank you so much, Daniel, particularly yes. given how busy and in demand you are, as people can, and people I think can, can see why. Um, for those watching, do share this video, press like and subscribe. But Daniel, just to say a very, very special thanks for sharing all that with us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Owen.